Hello, once again, this is Corey Smith with Petersburg Church of Christ, and this is chapter 18 of the book Muscle and a Shovel. To get started today, let's take a look at our outline, our study guide here, uh, we would say. And we have one verse that we want to put on our index cards for this chapter to memorize and add to our stack of cards. And that would be Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, Jesus says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Now, we'll keep that verse in mind, and we will get into chapter 18 here of the book Muscle and a Shovel by Michael J. Shank. We appreciate you tuning in to follow along with this study. The smell hit me as soon as I stepped through our apartment door. German chocolate cake. I kicked off my shoes, dropped my briefcase by the door, threw the keys on the counter, and lifted off the large glass lid that covered Janetta's latest creation. Four layers with that gooey pecan coconut stuff in between. Janetta was soaking in the tub. I unsnapped the Seco chronograph from my wrist. You're late, she hollered from the bathroom. Traffic and ice, I responded. There were no cell phones in the 80s, or at least none that I could afford. The roads were bad when I came home, too, and I heard her trip the drain plug. You getting in the shower, she asked. Not just yet. I've got some Bible stuff to show you. How about we talk about it over some cake, I volleyed. Sounds like a plan, she hollered back. We stood at the counter eating cake. I caught her up to speed. The conversation with the Methodist minister Asking Randall about it, Randall getting amped up, finding out that the part I needed for my one backlog repaired was still not in. So rather than coming on home, I asked Randall to split the barbecue with me while we reasoned the Bible together. So you've just spent the last three hours at the office talking with Randall about the Bible, she asked, without showing any surprise. Yep, I replied, and I'll give you the highlights. We opened our Bibles and I reviewed the biblical conversation Randall and I had at the office and what Randall revealed. Baptize is a word that was not translated into the English language. It was transliterated. Transliterating simply means to change a word's letters into the corresponding letters of another alphabet. It's not a translation from one language into another. The word baptize comes from the Greek word baptizo. Baptizo means to submerge, to immerse completely, or to fully go under the surface. However, the translators of the King James Bible had been influenced by the Catholic doctrine of sprinkling. Therefore, when they came to the Greek word baptizo, their preconceived belief about sprinkling caused them to transliterate the word rather than to actually translate it into the English word immerse as they should have done. However, immersion opposed their Catholic doctrine of sprinkling and pouring. What were the translators who were already influenced by Catholicism going to do with a word that would ultimately destroy their doctrine of sprinkling and pouring? Transliteration. This allowed the translators to leave the Greek word baptizo in its original form, for the most part, and gave them opportunity to mask the word's real meaning. So they dropped the D changed the O to an E, and voila, the word baptize was born. Transliteration of the word allowed the Catholic doctrine of sprinkling and pouring to remain intact because the word baptize was so vague. It was a strange, almost, it's a strange word. <laughs> Therefore, religious people accepted the false idea promoted by Catholicism that the word baptize could mean to sprinkle to pour over or to immerse. Most importantly, the word baptize would not directly oppose the sprinkling and pouring doctrine advocated by the Catholic Church. Consider the impact upon the translation if the translators would have rendered baptizo into the word immerse as they should have done. Mark 16, 16 in the King James Version reads, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but he that believeth not shall be damned. However, the verse should read, 
He that believeth and is immersed shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. To baptize does not mean to sprinkle or to pour over. To baptize means only one thing, to immerse. To teach that baptism means to sprinkle or pour over is to completely misrepresent the original meaning of the command. Denominations that sprinkle and pour do so by reading Mark 16, 16, 16 in the following way. He that believeth and is sprinkled or poured on shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Sprinkling and pouring is not baptizo. One might as well say, he that believes and dances under a maple tree shall be saved. It's the same difference. Remember, if you change immersion into sprinkle, you might as well change it to anything else you like. Again, what if the translators had not transliterated the Greek word baptizo? What if they would have translated the Greek word, uh, what if they would have translated the Greek into English without the influence of Catholicism and without any attempt to preserve the doctrine of sprinkling and pouring? The answer is clear. Everywhere the word baptizo appeared in the Greek, the word immerse would have appeared in the English. The doctrine of sprinkling and pouring would have been destroyed. Infant baptism would have been destroyed as well. What we do is critical. Randall said that there were specific life and death points found in the Bible. One of them was found in Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. He that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. This is a scene in the future on the day of judgment. Jesus said that many will plead with him, reminding him that they did things in his name. They prophesied and cast out devils or demons and did many wonderful things. However, Christ will cast them away, declaring that he simply does not know them. Why? Because they worked iniquity. In other words, they practiced things that were foreign to the New Testament. They certainly did many things in the name of Christ and their particular religion, but they did not do the will of God. I was familiar with the verse. It was, in my heart and mind, one of the most sobering verses in the entire Bible. The more I read it, the more I understood it. Jesus painted a visual picture of the many who will plead their case. Randall said that we need to understand exactly who these people will be. The word says that these will be the rapists and the murderers and the child molesters and the porn stars, but that is where the world makes their mistake. The mistake is thinking that Jesus Christ is speaking only of the scoundrels of society. Why is it a mistake to think this? Because Jesus is giving us insight into the fact that the vast majority of those rejected by him on the day of judgment will be those who believe that they were Christians while living on this earth. They will be people who prophesied, cast out demons, and did many wonderful works, all in the name of Jesus Christ. Look at the text again. They said they had done these things in his name, but in the end, Jesus will not know them. There are many people living on the earth at this very moment wearing the name Christian and doing many good works in the name of Jesus Christ. But at the end of time, Jesus will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. How can we figure out if we are working iniquity or doing the will of God? That's the $64,000 question, isn't it? One thing was clear. Bible baptism was not getting sprinkled on or poured over. So. What have we seen in this chapter? couple of action points we want to look at. We want to research what transliteration is. Well, what did we find out from the chapter? 
transliteration is not necessarily translating the word the way it should be, but changing some letters in order to really, in a, in a way, make it say what we want it to say or say something that it doesn't say. Continue to memorize a note card as we did here, Matthew 5, 14. Put that on your note card, start to memorize that, and then go over your stack of note cards that have your ver verses on that so that you can begin to memorize more verses and hopefully someday, like Randall, you can quote verses off the top of your head as they relate to scenarios that come up in study with someone. So let's talk about how the word baptizo was transliterated. Well, let's go back in the chapter and we'll let Randall explain that to us. We see where the Catholic church had the doctrine of sprinkling and pouring. Baptize is a word that was not translated into the English language. It was never baptized, did not exist in the English language prior to this translation from the Greek. It was transliterated. It means to change a word's letters into the corresponding letters of another alphabet. It's not a translation from one language into another. It comes from the Greek word baptizo, which means to submerge, to immerse completely, to fully go under the surface. So what does the word baptizo, how was it transliterated? It was inconvenient for those at the time who were translating the King James Bible. They had heavy influence from Catholic doctrine. So we're seeing where the first denomination off of the Lord's church is still even to this day and even up until this point, 1600 years later, still having a heavy hand in what you and I read in the Bible today. Now, because it would have been inconvenient for the Catholic doctrine to properly translate the word baptizo into the word immerse, what happened? Immersion opposed Catholic doctrine of sprinkling and pouring So therefore, it had to be translated in such a way that didn't rule that out. And what happened? The translators dropped the D, changed the O to an E, and voila, we have a brand new word added to the English language, baptize. And what did it do? It allowed the Catholic doctrine of sprinkling and pouring to remain intact. No one had seen the word baptize before. So it was vague. It was strange. Religious people accepted the false idea, which was heavily promoted by Catholicism, by the way, that the word could mean to sprinkle or to pour or to immerse. Now watch this. We talked about this in, when we read the chapter. If someone would have taken a stand against the error of Catholic doctrine, sprinkling and pouring, how would our King James Bible today read? It would have read, he that believeth and is immersed shall be saved. But as it stands, we have he that believeth and is baptized, a word that was foreign to the English language, but coming from the Greek baptizo meant to immerse, to fully go under to submerge would have been more accurate. To baptize does not mean to sprinkle or pour. It means only one thing, immerse. If you teach that baptism means to sprinkle or pour over, you are totally misrepresenting the original meaning of the command. That's why today we have denominations. We could get into a whole other discussion about why they baptized. We can't even get the mode right, the process right. Because the idea of sprinkling and pouring comes from Catholic doctrine. 
It's not baptizo. And if we're going to say that, we might as well say, well, if you're going to say, listen, understand this. Because the word was not properly translated and a new word was completely made up, that's where Randall comes away saying, if you're going to say that baptize in the English language means to sprinkle or to pour, it doesn't, if you go back to the original Greek language, then you might as well say that he who dances under a maple tree <laughs> shall be saved. Because if you're going to make it up to say one thing, you might as well make it up to say something else. What if the translators had not transliterated the Greek word baptizo? What if they would have translated the Greek into English without the influence of Catholicism and without any attempt to preserve the doctrine of sprinkling and pouring? The answer is clear. Everywhere the word baptizo appeared in the Greek, the word immerse would have appeared in the English and the doctrine of sprinkling and pouring would have been destroyed. And it would have also taken out the doctrine of infant baptism would have been kind of convenient, inconvenient in the day for those following Catholic doctrine or any other denomination that had spun off of Catholic doctrine. So what we do is critical. Why is it critical? Jesus tells us, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, Matthew 7, 21 to 23, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not cast out demons in thy name, and in thy name done many wonderful works, What's Jesus going to say to them? Then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, the idea here is focusing, the, the subject at hand is focusing on baptism. Those who are adhering to the false doctrine of sprinkling and pouring. What has Jesus said here? Jesus might as well have said, if you sprinkle and pour, I don't know you. I don't know you depart. What is the sad reality of this whole situation? We mistakenly think that in this idea in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, where Jesus says, depart from me, you who work iniquity. We mistakenly think that Jesus is only talking to the worst of the worst in our society. We think he's only talking to the rapists, the murderers, the thieves, the child molesters, the porn stars. We could name it. We could go down the line. Every sin you can think of. The reality is he's talking to those who think that they are Christians. Why do they think that they are Christians? because they have been deceived by a false doctrine. They have been deceived by the traditions, and that's what this was in the Catholic Church. It was a tradition. It was a man-made mandate of sprinkling and pouring. Are there going to be those who stand up and present heartwarming sermons Yes. Are there going to be those who go out and feed hundreds and thousands of people? Yes. Are there those who are going to go out and make sure that people have warm coats in the wintertime? Yes. Does that mean they have done it in the name of or by the authority of Jesus Christ? No. How can you say that? Jesus said it. Look at the text again. They said they had done these things in his name, but in the end, Jesus is still not going to know them. When we do things by our own authority and we leave out the will of God, what's the will of God is what's found in his word. 
we have put ourselves into a position of making ourselves God. There are many people living on the earth this very moment wearing the name Christian. Let me elaborate. There are people on this earth who claim to be members of the church of Christ. Some of you watching this may say, oh, you pick on the denominations all the time. No, I'm an equal opportunity offender. Because there are some of those who claim to be my own brethren in the church of Christ that are just as guilty of this. They are teaching that baptism, not essential, or it doesn't matter. There are those who are teaching that those who may have been sprinkled or poured in a denomination, they're fine, just come on over here and sit in our building. There are those who are out here bragging about feeding hundreds of people once a month, and what they're doing is no more found in the Bible than the man in the moon. But I'm the jerk that says that. When you lay down what a person is doing in the name of religion next to what the Bible says, if the action does not match the instruction manual, it's not in the name of Jesus. You can say Jesus Christ all day long and say, well, I'm doing this. I'm doing this to the glory of Jesus. That's not what that's talking about. When the police bang on your door, open up in the name of the law. What does that mean? By the authority granted to them by the law. When the preacher says, by the authority vested in me by the state of Tennessee, you are now man and wife. What makes that possible? The laws that govern marriage in the state of Tennessee say Bobby and Susie are now husband and wife. They have met the conditions of the state set out. That's a whole other discussion for another day about the conditions by God for what constitutes a marriage. But that's what, that's what we're talking about here. Many people living on the earth at this very moment, wearing the name Christian and doing many good works in the name of Jesus Christ. In the time, Jesus is going to say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. And what is he going to say? Well, we're doing good things. Jesus says you worked iniquity. And I think it's interesting how Brother Shank closes out the chapter when he says, how can we figure out if we are working iniquity or doing the will of God? That's a $64,000 question, isn't it? Um, the first step could be open up the Bible. And if you can't find what you're doing in the Bible, maybe you ought to at least, at the very least, stop doing it until you can find it. And if you can't find it, maybe it's time to rewind and reread the instruction manual. But that's not a popular thing to say, is it? Again, I appreciate you tuning in. I know this one is a little bit shorter than chapter 17, but I appreciate your time stopping in, reading this chapter. If you have any questions, I did this a little differently this time. I'm broadcasting simultaneously. I hope you can see this on the screen on Facebook Live. Um, I'm kind of flipping back and forth and watching on my phone to make sure that everything is popping up like it should. But if you have questions on our website or here in the comments of the Facebook Live, we'd love to hear from you. If you're here local in the Petersburg area, I see it on my phone. It's a little bit of a delay, but it is working like it's supposed to. That's good. If you're here local in the Petersburg area, come and visit with us. Sunday mornings, 10 a.m. Bible classes. Worship at 11 and 6 p.m. Wednesday nights, we have Bible classes at 7 p.m. Always online at scatteringtheseed.com. If you're watching here on Facebook, our Facebook page, Petersburg Church of Christ. Again, my name is Corey Smith. You didn't see a whole lot of my face today because it doesn't matter what I look like. I'm just here trying to teach the truth to you. Hopefully the seed is being scattered, planted, taking root. We're watering 
and God gives the increase. Have a great day. Hope to see you again soon.